Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Olivia de Havilland and Paul Lucas in Appointment for Love. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In motion pictures, a straight line is not always the shortest distance between two points. Take the case of Paul Lucas. After making 10 or 12 pictures for for 10 or 12 years here in Hollywood, he was suddenly discovered all over again on Broadway. Watch on the Rhine was the play that turned the trick. When Mr. Lucas played that same part on the screen for Warner Brothers, the result was the Academy Award. Tonight he's here in the Lux Radio Theater to co-star with the talented Olivia de Havilland, who finished high school and began starring in pictures in almost the same breath. She's been making the screen look lovelier ever since. And just recently has added a brighter note to the scenery in the Aleutian Islands, of which more later. Tonight we've cast these stars in Universal's gay romance, Appointment for Love. The appointment in this instance is between a famous playwright and a woman doctor whose career puts a few rocks in the road to romance. In these days, the audience for one of our plays just about covers the globe. And many of the men in khaki and blue who used to join us at home now join us overseas. Many of them are also self-appointed ambassadors for such comforts of home as Lux Flakes. A photograph has just come in showing a sergeant in the midst of doing his washing somewhere in Australia. The wash tub is steaming away over a small wood fire, and there are tents in the background under a grove of eucalyptus trees. <laughs> I've never heard very many soldiers celebrate the joys of washing clothes, but the sergeant in the photograph is, is grinning broadly. Perhaps the reason is right there beside the wash tub. A familiar-looking box of Lux Flakes. And now, the familiar moment of curtain going up. And the first act of Appointment for Love, starring Olivia de Havilland as Jane and Paul Lucas as Andre. The curtain has fallen in the Hyperion Theater. The exit march is playing, but the audience will not leave. On their feet, Crowded in the aisles, New York's first nighters are clamoring for the author, Andre Castile. But one of the first nighters is not taking part in the demonstration. That young lady there in the second row. Through all the noise and confusion, she remains strangely calm. As a matter of fact, she's fast asleep. She is still dozing peacefully when Mr. Castile makes his entrance on the stage and holds up his hand for silence. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you don't expect me to say anything or do anything very clever. An artist's position in playmaking is... Oh, Hastings. See if there's a doctor in the house. That girl in the second row has fainted. Excuse me, please. Just let me through. Please, please. I'll take care of her. Is the young lady with you, madam? No, she isn't. She seems to be all alone. Oh, please, she needs air. Stand back, please. Is there a doctor in the house? Oh, Did somebody call a doctor? Don't worry now, young lady. You are going to be all right. Oh, but you see... Is this your purse? I'll I'll take it now. Just relax. What are you doing? I'm going to carry you. Up you go now. You'll feel better outside. Oh, thank you. Well, maybe I will. Boy, have you found a doctor yet? Yes, sir. The box office says there's a Dr. Alexander in seat 108. Dr. Alexander, Dr. Alexander... Wait, please. I'm Dr. Alexander. You? You... You are who? I'm Dr. Alexander. So you can put me down, please. Now, don't be silly. You are, you are ill. You fainted. Now, don't you be silly. I never fainted in my life. But I saw you faint. No, you saw me sleeping. Sleeping? I couldn't keep my eyes open, and I couldn't get out. And when you picked me up, I didn't want to make a scene. Oh, so you fell asleep at my play. I'm afraid I did. Do you mind? Hmm. My play is no good, hmm? Terrible. Now, will you put me down? Gladly, and good night. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for liking my play so much. 
But I must confess that the young lady who fainted did not faint. She was asleep. Andre and I adored your play tonight. Oh, good. Thank you, Ethel. Andre, don't you remember me? My name is Edith. Oh, well, well. Uh, thank you, Edith, then. Mr. Cashiel, you're wanted on the phone, sir. Miss Benson calling from Chicago. Oh, Nancy? Uh, let me have it. Uh, hello, Nancy. Andre. Yes, Nancy, of course I missed you. Oh, yes, yes, they liked it. Uh, some of them. Uh, what? Uh... Why, why, of course you are going to be my next play. Uh, here, darling, I'll, I'll let you talk to Hastings. George, take this. is Nancy Benson. Oh, sure. Hello, Nancy. How are you? Huh? The next play? Wait a minute. Did you promise her a part in the next one? No, no, no. Oh. Hello, Nancy. Why, we'd love to have you. Andre's tried to sell me the idea of you doing the part a dozen times. Now, we'll talk about it. Goodbye, love. You're still stuck on that girl dream boat? No, no, no more. Finny. Finny? She wouldn't be bad. No, but she wouldn't be good either. Anyway, I've got another idea. A pretty one? Ah, uh, beautiful. There's a young lady to see you, Mr. Cathedral. Oh, excuse me, George. Good evening. Oh, uh, hello. Hello. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your party, but you picked up my purse and my keys were in it. Hello, Cathedral. Beautiful play. Beautiful. What a wonderful review. Great praise. I hate to disagree with such a fine critic, but you've been taken in again, old man. The best play you've ever written, Andre. Perhaps, but it's still not very good. <laughs> now, 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 poke your fingers into any of my characters, and what would you find, Doctor? Well, I, I'm sure I don't know. I will tell you. Sawdust. Just sawdust. I'm afraid that's true. Now, my key... Now, you also agree that my situations are phony and unbelievable, huh? I agree, absolutely. Now, if you... Now, you're... you are not just agreeing to be polite, No, you? I'm not. I'm agreeing because I agree completely. The people in your play were unreasonable, illogical. Uh, oh, they were in love. And love is an unreasonable and illogical emotion. I'm sorry, but love is very logical. So logical, you can prove it in the laboratory. It's a chemical attraction based on a law governing affinity. Put two objects with affinity in a test tube, and they merge through attraction. It's the simplest of all formulae. Uh, 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 that's, that's very scientific, I'm sure, but... All don't... you do is just add a little rose-colored romance and cloud up what's really happening. Now, if you don't mind, I'll take my keys and go home. Oh, no, no, no. I want to talk to you. You are, you are the only person who, who knows the truth about my plays, except myself, of course. Oh, Mr. Casile, you're the worst kind of a faker. You like your plays. You think they're wonderful. My purse, please. Good night. Ah. Say, hey, Dreamboat, wasn't that the babe who fainted in the theater? Uh, she's no babe. She's a doctor. And you know what the doctor thinks, Georgie? She thinks that love is something you make in a test tube. <laughs> Dr. Alexander's office. No, Dr. Gunther, she isn't here just now. Yes, sir, I'll tell her. Morning, Nora. Oh, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Gunther just called. He wants to see you about that strep case. And uh, there's a new patient in your office. Thanks. Hello, Doctor. Well. Well, here I am. I came to see you do it. Do what? Make love with the test tube. You know, you said you put in two people and... Mr. Casile, I'm very busy, and we're not allowed to have social calls here at the hospital. Oh, oh, this is not a social call, Dr. Alexander. I I didn't sleep one wink all night, thinking about what you told me. Oh, Dr. Alexander, Dr. Gunther's here. Oh. May I come in, Doctor? Certainly. Uh, this is Dr. Gunther, our chief of staff, and uh, Mr. Andre Casile. How do you do? How are you, Mr. Casile? I never felt better in my life. Uh, uh, well, that is, uh, until last night. Yes, sir. Uh, Last night, I, I, I just went to peace. And what seems to be the trouble, Mr. Cassil? I believe it's my heart, Doctor. I see. Now, you don't mind if I watch your examination of the patient, Dr. Alexander? Why, uh, no, not at all. But I think probably Mr. Cassil would rather come back when he has more time. Oh, no, no. Might just as well get it over with while I'm here. Let me feel your pulse, please. Uh, Dr. Alexander is my assistant. I like to watch these young ones. Sometimes they can teach us old fellows a thing or two. Uh, you say you're having a little trouble with your heart, eh? Yes, Doctor. I think probably it's occupational disease. He probably overworks it. Now, I've seen many of your plays, Mr. Castile. Very interesting. Oh, thank you, sir. Will you take off your coat, please? Oh, yes, yes, my coat, my coat. And uh, open your shirt. Uh, the shirt? Uh, what for? 
I want to listen to your heart. Oh, I'm sure I'm going to feel much better, Doctor. No talking, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Stethoscope, nurse. Yes, Doctor. Quiet now. Certainly. Oh, <laughs> it's so cold. Please, no talking. <laughs> hmm. Very unusual. Really? What does it sound like? Well, I'd say offhand it's... Uh... Oh, really? I'm afraid so. Did you hear anything good? Do you drink very much, Mr. Cassil? Oh, no, no, a little wine. Sometimes a little brandy and uh, a little whiskey. Dr. Alexander may have to stop all that. Dr. Alexander certainly will. Oh, uh, how much sleep do you average, Mr. Cassil? Now, not very much at night, but quite a bit in the morning. Early evening hours are the best, aren't they, Dr. Gunther? They certainly are. Now, Mr. Cassil, will you jump up and down on one foot, please? Certainly. I really think that it's a matter of fatigue, Dr. Gunther. Too much work? Too much play. All right, you can stop that now. I want to listen again. Now, this part I like very much. No talking, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm. Yes. Mr. Cassil, I would suggest that for the time being you give up liquor... Not play so hard and get more sleep. Later on, if it seems necessary, we'll have a thorough examination. Oh, why not do it now, Doctor? If the patient is ready, I'm sure it would be better to do it uh, all at once. Thank you, Dr. Gunther. You don't know how helpful you've been. Will you step this way, please? Of course. And uh, I'll look at all your reports, Mr. Cassie. Yes. Thank you. I'll drop by later, Dr. Alexander. Very well, Doctor. I guess you're stuck with him, Doctor. We'll see who gets stuck. Give him the work. Everything? Everything. We'll start off by taking some blood from his arm for the lab. Yes, Doctor. Hand me a needle, please. I'm waiting, Dr. Alexander. I'm coming. Needle, Doctor. Thanks. All right, now, Mr. Cassil, your arm, please. Just hold it still. Now, now, look. Before we start, what about dinner tonight? Steady, Mr. Cassil. But what about... Oh! <laughs> Hello, office? This is Dr. Alexander calling... I have a patient who's been coming to my office every day for two weeks. His name is Cassil. Well, he's not to be allowed to come to my office again. He's cured. Yes. And uh, if he insists, will you, ha uh, will you please have him shown to psychiatry? Thank you. Of course, I know you don't like it, but you're having a good time? I like to dance. Is that all? I used to dance a lot. Mm, really? That sounds very frivolous. But it proves I was right. It doesn't prove a thing. No? No. Decidedly no. Sure. Look, we've been out now five or six times. We've dined, we've danced. Still, there are no rosy-colored clouds. Oh, it's too soon. But speaking of clouds, I have a place in the country I would like you to see. An old hunting lodge. Is that where you write your play? Well, not exactly. It's too nice for work. So quiet and peaceful. Sounds like an ideal place to write your play. And there's a waterfall. You can hear it from the house at night. Sounds wonderful. Will you come to see it sometime? Oh, I'm very busy. Doctors never get vacation. Well, Dr. Alexander... Yes? ...call for you, doctor. They want you at the hospital right away. Emergency. Oh, Andre, I'm terribly sorry. I always get emergencies when I'm having the most fun. I'll go with you. Certainly not. I might be hours. Goodbye, Andre. But... You want me again tonight? Don't worry, we won't. And you've got to get some rest. You look all in. Don't you think someone ought to drive you home? No, I'll be all right. I'm just a little jumpy, that's all. Good night. Good night, Doc. Jane. Andre. Hello. How did you know I wanted to see you waiting out here? You said you would work very late. And I was afraid you'd be tired. Oh, I am tired, but I never felt so wonderful in my whole life. They said she couldn't live, but she did. They both lived. I never saw you look this way before. I never felt like this before. I was going to call you. And, and you were waiting right here. I will always be waiting. Always. Oh, Andre. You know, I'm kind of surprised at myself. You don't mind my saying that. This is something I, I never thought I'd do, ever. I'm very happy that you changed your mind. Darling, I'm not being silly about it, am I? No. You are being very sweet. We'll be all alone at my hunting lodge. Nobody will even know we're there, will they? Nobody but the people who take care of the place. And you don't have to worry about them. I still can't believe it. 
Mrs. Andre Casille. Oh, Andre, it sounds beautiful. There's a wire, Martha. Arriving tonight, see? Uh, you think I'd better make up two rooms? No, Martha. He says he's bringing his bride up here. Well, it's about time Mr. Castile settled down. Well, I don't know. We had a lot of fun. Remember the time three girls showed up at once? <laughs> we certainly played hide-and-seek that weekend. You ought to think shame of yourself, you mean men. The only way we could get him out of the house was to say he had to go to a fire. He wore my helmet and carried my axe. He certainly looks silly, too. I wonder which one of them he married. Well, you know, I, I think I'd fancy the Benson girl. Yes, the Benson girl, that's the one. Uh, that is, uh, if it was me that was doing it. There they are. Hello, Timothy. Hello, Mr. Castillo. Welcome home, Mr. Castillo. Hello, Martha. Congratulations to you, sir. And to you, too, ma'am. Thank you, Timothy. She's wonderful, but a little bit heavy. Put me down, darling. Hello, Martha. Hello, Timothy. Welcome, Mrs. Castillo. Well, this is a surprise. Quite a surprise, I must say. Well, Mr. Castillo, you certainly did very well for yourself. Thank you, Timothy. Now, how about some wine? It's all ready, sir. You'll have it in two minutes. I'll fix some supper, Mr. Castillo. Oh, what a nice house. Andre. And what a nice wife to live in it. My wife. That sounds kind of new, but I suppose I'll get used to it. My wife. My husband sounds new, too. Nice and new and, and warm. Hello? Come on, I want to show you our, our waterfall. Who? There, you can see it from the window. Hey, just a minute. Oh, it's lovely, Andre. Oh, uh, Mr. Castile. Who is it, Timothy? Well, uh, it's for you, sir. A certain party. Well, just tell him I'm not to be disturbed. I can't tell him that. And he's going to disturb you quite a lot. It's uh, the old chief. What chief? Which, which chief do you mean? The old chief. Fire Chief Benson. Fire Chief? What, what in the world would have... Oh, oh, Fire Chief Benson. Uh, that's right. Fire Chief Benson. And he's very excited and he seems to be heading up this way. What's he coming here for? Oh, he drops in from time to time. We talk about fires. Everybody here belongs to the volunteer fire department. I'll, I'll, I'll speak to him. You know, this sounds like fun. Yeah, sometimes it is, ma'am, and sometimes it isn't. Is there a fire now? Uh, there's smoke, ma'am. Oh, yes, quite a lot of smoke. Hello. How are you, Chief? Hello, Kathy. What's going on up there? I just got in from New York tonight, Kathy. Come on down to the station and get Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I'd love to, Chief, but I'm on my honeymoon. What? Whose honeymoon? Mine. It's, it's nobody you know, Chief. No, wait, Chief. It, 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 well, if that's the way you feel, I'll certainly do my duty. I'll be right down to the station. You can count on me. I thought so. I'll be waiting. Make it snappy, Pappy. Uh, bye, Chief. Well, I have to go. Is there a fire in the depot, sir? Oh, a very, very bad one. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jane, but community duty, you know. I'll, I'll be back. Well, come on, darling. I'll go with you. No, 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 no. They, they won't let women go. They wouldn't like it, would they, Timothy? Oh, no. The chief had just raised the roof, ma'am, if you showed up. Well, all right, but be careful. I will. Timothy, my axe and my fire head. Coming up, sir. And don't take any foolish chances, on Yes, me. and don't get burned. I won't, I promise. Bye. <laughs> Me the depot, please. Thank you. Hello, depot. How's the fire going? The fire? Why, well, of course there's a fire. Oh. Oh, there isn't? Well, is Mr. Castile there? He is. Talking to a... Oh, a young lady. Well, thank you. Good night. Again. Here, yeah, dear. Uh, hello, darling. Sorry I was so long. Tell me all about it. Was it bad? Ah, it was a very stubborn blaze. Very hard to get under control, but it's, it's all out now. Nothing left but the ashes? Yes? Nothing. I could see the flames from the upstairs window. Huh? You, you, you could see the... <coughs> want some wine. <clears throat> Your throat must be very dry. Uh, yes, it is. It is very. Sit down. I'll get it. You're probably exhausted. Oh, no. I, I, I feel fine. Your face is so hot. Oh, I hope you didn't get too near the flame. Oh, no, 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 no. I was very careful about that. Hmm, your pulse is pretty fast. Well, it's the, the effect you have on me, darling. It might be the suspense, too. Uh, the uh, suspense? Yes. You weren't quite sure I would believe your fire chief story. Oh, I, uh... Didn't fool you, huh? <laughs> Not for long. 
Oh, darling, you didn't have to go to so much trouble. You could have told me the truth. Were you afraid I'd be jealous? Well, it was sort of the idea. But I'm never jealous. Oh, but most women are. Oh, but that's because they don't understand it. You know, jealousy is a very simple thing. Physiologically, it's merely the adrenal gland pumping adrenaline into the bloodstream. Of course, it has a psychological trigger. Bing. Yes, like that. <laughs> that's the glands working. Oh, but that's a hangover from caveman days and has no place in a civilized mind. <laughs> you really believe all that? Well, I certainly do believe it. Listen, if you ever catch me being jealous, I give you leave to put on your tiger skin, pick up your club, and beat me back to my senses. Oh, that might be fun. <laughs> Jane, darling, aren't you tired? Not a bit. Want to go for a walk? I certainly do not want to go for a walk. No, neither do I. Oh, now, who can that be? Another fire, darling. Hello? No, no, sis. I, I, I don't think so. Who? No, he ain't got any Dr. Alexander here. Oh, we Timothy, know. that's for me. Excuse me, dear. Hey, just a minute. Thank you, Timothy. Hello? Yes, Dr. Gunther. Oh, really? Why, yes, of course I can. Wait just a minute. Andre. What's wrong? I have to get back to the hospital. Hello, Dr. Gunther. We'll drive in. I'll make it as soon as I can. It's perfectly all right. Good night. Dr. Edward has been hurt, and I have to get back and take over his cases. Tonight? Yes, and I have to get dressed. But, darling, this is our honeymoon. I know. I'm terribly sorry, Andre. No, no, I won't let you go. Andre, don't be silly. There are 20 patients waiting for me there. But I am waiting here. But you're not sick, darling. But I am so. Look at my tongue, see? Now feel my head. I've got a fever. I'm coming down with something. Andre, you do look sort of funny. There, now, you see? Timothy, put Mr. Cassiel to bed. Yes, Now, now, wait, now, Put don't. him to bed right away, Timothy, and put an ice bag at his feet. If he gets a chill, good. Good night, dear. But, Jane... In a moment, Mr. DeMille presents Paul Lucas and Olivia de Havilland in Act Two of Appointment for Love. But now, here's a musical fairy tale. The scene is the bedroom of Susie the Spendthrift, getting ready for a special, a, a very special date. She's looking through her clothes closet and... Maybe my blue one. Dick likes blue. Oh, dear, it looks awful. How about the green? Gosh, it's all tired out. <laughs> Maybe the red. No, maybe the gold. Goodness, no. And then... The dressers stepped right out of the closet, and one of them said... Susie, Susie, don't you know how to keep, keep dresses looking like new? Listen while we tell you the secret. Hear those bubbles? Gentle Lux bubbles. Just a dip. Never a touch of strong soap. Never any rubbing with cake soap. Just a dip in Lux, and dresses come out lovely, looking like new. Susie, don't you know people stop? Look at girls whose dresses have that Lux look. Anything safe in water is safe in Lux. And how much you save. Because clothes lead a long life. When they lead a luck flight. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Two of Appointment for Love, starring Olivia de Havilland as Jane and Paul Lucas as Andre. So far, the marriage of the successful playwright and the successful woman doctor has been a dismal failure. The first two days of Jane's honeymoon have been spent at the hospital, working day and night. Now Andre has returned to his apartment in New York, only to find that his bride has taken a separate apartment in the same building. This is ridiculous. What's wrong with this place? Nothing. It, it, it's large. I, I, I like it. I, it's where I live. 
If you don't like it, I'll get another one. But, darling, that's not the idea. You've got to be reasonable. I want to be reasonable, but there is no reason in the world for me to live on the 17th floor and my wife to live on the 22nd. There are many reasons. I don't want to hear any of them. All right, if you don't want to listen to me, I'll just go upstairs. But who ever heard of a bird building two nests? In this case, it happens to be very necessary. I'm sorry, I don't see any necessity at all. We can talk it over when you're a little calmer. Ring for the elevator, please. I want to talk it over right now. Darling, I don't want to upset you. I am not upset. I just don't understand this kind of a joke. It's not a joke. Going up. 22, please. Now, listen, Jane. Andre, please don't be difficult about something that's very sensible and very sound. Sensible? When we were married, you knew that I was a doctor and that I was going on with my work. Yes, but I didn't know that I would have to make an appointment every time I wanted to see you. Please, let me finish. All right, go ahead. Now... I have to be at the hospital at all hours. Sometimes I come in so tired I don't want to see anybody. Sometimes I get called at 4 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes I work all night and sleep all day. Now, really, you couldn't possibly fit your life into that crazy kind of routine. I only know one thing. 22, madam. Thank you. I only know that when a man marries a woman, it's because he wants to be married to her. But you will be married to me, and I'll be married to you. The only difference is that I'll be free to do my work and you'll be free to do your work. Now, really, isn't that a very sensible plan? No. Why? No, Why isn't it sensible? Because, because it, 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 it's like that test tube idea of yours. It figures out everything but human relationships. Andre, look, the most important thing is for our marriage to last. You think so? Yes. Well, I think the most important thing is for our marriage to begin. <laughs> and it will not begin until you come home. And home is where the husband lives. That's the law. The law? Really, that's very funny. I don't think so. I refuse to argue about it in the hall. Do you want to come inside? No, I don't. Very well. Good night, Andre. Good night. Going down? Seventeen. Seventeen. You want I should wait for the lady? No, seventeen. <laughs> But it's Mrs. Casillo. She's come to have breakfast with you. Uh, huh? What? Your wife, sir. She's here for breakfast. Uh, breakfast? What time is it? It's almost a quarter of seven, sir. Almost a quarter of seven? In the morning? Get out of here before I kill you. Yes, sir. Uh, shall I tell madam you're not accustomed to having breakfast before twelve, sir? Tell her the... Oh, never mind. I'll tell her myself. Get me a robe. Yes, sir. Here, Arthur. I woke the cook up, sir, and breakfast will be ready in a few minutes. Stop talking about breakfast. Quarter of seven. Where's my wife? In the dining room, sir. Quarter of seven. I'd never heard of such a... Good morning. Good morning. Sit down, dear. I hope I'm not too early. No, no, no. I always get up in the middle of the night to have breakfast. Oh, it's going to be fun. We can have breakfast together every morning. Every morning? I promise. The same time? Yes. You see, this gives me plenty of time to get down to the hospital at 7.30. Morning's your dress. You can walk down with me. Oh, it isn't far, only a mile. Oh, uh, that would be interesting, too. We could walk around all by ourselves at half past seven in the morning. I certainly shall look, look forward to that. Andre, have you thought about last night? A uh, little. I'm sorry, we quarreled. So am I. Oh, here's the key to my apartment. I already have the one to yours. That's marvelous. You, you have everything figured out. I'll tell you all about it at dinner tonight. Dinner? But dinner seems so far away. <coughs> Will madam have oatmeal? Yes, lots of cream. Will you have oatmeal, sir? What? No, I, I thought not. Now, what are your plans for the day? Hmm? The day? Oh, oh, you mean today, now. Sausage and egg, sir. Coffee, strong coffee. Yes, sir. I thought maybe if I could get time off for lunch. I could meet you at the little restaurant where we had our first meal. Ah, that's a very romantic idea. I feel romantic today. This is our first breakfast together. Mm hmm All right, then. I'll pick you up at the theater and we'll have lunch. After that, I have an ulcer operation at three. Oh. <laughs> come on, George. Come on, come on. Wake up. Get up. Uh, what, what's the matter? What's the matter? Wake up, George. I want to talk to you. Oh, I'm dreaming. No, you are not dreaming. I had to talk to someone, and nobody I know is up yet. Uh, what time is it? Eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock? Hey, I thought you were on a honeymoon. That's what I thought. George, I, I, I married a monster. What? 
I married a monster. This had better be good. It's very bad. My wife eats breakfast at seven in the morning, then walks to work one mile. If I am dressed, she's going to let me walk with her. Now, what can I do? Shoot her. Oh, but I love her. Then shoot yourself. Now, George, please, please be serious. At eight o'clock in the morning? And not only that. She has her own apartment five floors up. She... Say that again, slowly. She lives on the 22nd floor, and I live on the 17th floor. And she won't come down. She won't? No, and I won't go up. What do you want me to do? You don't need a producer. You need a lawyer. Oh, no, no, no. It's just some silly idea that she has about marriage. Two people have to be two people. She has her work. Can't she work and be married, too? Yes, but she wants her own apartment. Oh, I get it. You live your life, and I live mine. Well, go ahead and live your life. She'll get so jealous, she'll turn into a human fly and crawl down the outside nah, of the building. No, nah, no, nah, she doesn't believe in jealousy. You've got to believe in something. Look here. Act one, wife won't play house. Act two, husband makes wife jealous. Act three, they wind up in each other's arms. Curtain falls. Dreamboat, it's a cinch. It's sure fire. Now, just, just go back to sleep, George. Thank you. <laughs> You know, darling, that we are celebrating our 48th wedding anniversary? Our what? 48 hours. Oh. And we've done nothing but quarrel. Nothing? Coffee, sir. Yes, please. Jane, I've been thinking a lot about it since breakfast. So have I. Tonight we'll have dinner together in my apartment. We'll have dinner there every night. That was part of the plan. And we'll have breakfast there, too. Of course we will. I want to be with you as much as I possibly can. Alex, is it really you? Why, Michael. Michael Daly. Oh, how nice. Well, this is a rare piece of good fortune. I don't believe Just it. off the plane about half an hour ago. No. Called the hospital three times, wandered in here to drown, drown my despair, and here you are in my very cheek. <laughs> really, Michael? You know, I was going to write you a million times, but you know, I never write letters. And anyway, you never answer them. No. Uh, Gene, um... uh, pardon me, old fellow. You don't mind if I sit down? Oh, no. No, thanks. Alex, I thought of a dozen ways to lure you to Brazil, but I knew you wouldn't come. Michael, listen. What have you been doing? You look peaked. Mike, will you please stop? I'm trying to introduce Mr. Cassini. Uh, how do you do? Now, you mustn't be busy tonight, Alex. You have to run me all over New York. Michael. I want to do all the old places we used to. Michael, Mr. Cassini is my husband. Oh, that's very nice, yes. And, uh, what? Did you say husband? Yes, she did say her husband. Yes, Michael, we're married. Oh, well, I don't like that at all. I, I walk around the corner, go to Brazil, and the moment my back's turned, you marry the first beggar who comes along. Uh, pardon me, old fellow. Surely. Surely, I know what you mean. Michael, Mr. Cassil is the Mr. Cassil, the very famous one who writes the play. Well, don't tell me you married him for that reason. I'm famous, too. She never married me. That she never was going to get married, but I was gentleman enough to believe her. But if she was going to get married, I certainly think she should have married me. I saw you first, you know. You, uh, you don't mind, old fellow. No, no, certainly not. I think you made a great mistake in getting married at all, Jane. A brilliant career in medicine, your own life. You might have turned out to be a great doctor. But I'm still practicing. Oh, he can't even support you, eh? Now, wait, my friend. Now, wait. No, Michael, you see... I don't see what you want to live in New York for anyway. You'd be much better off as a doctor on one of my expeditions. Catch new microbes, go into jungles, fight epidemics with one hand and natives with the other. And, and you pass all that up for marriage here in New York... Living in a little cooped-up apartment. Two apartments. All right, two apartments, six apartments. What difference does it make? Well, why, why two apartments? It's a long story, and we don't want to go into it now. You know, Andre, Michael is an explorer. He goes to all kinds of weird places, meets all kinds of weird people. Well, you don't have to go very far. You meet them everywhere. Uh, no offense, old fellow. Oh, no, no. Two apartments. Well, well. Michael used to be a patient of mine, didn't you, Michael? Mm-mm, you bet I was. That's why I'm back here. Devil a lot of fun having Janie for a doctor, old fellow. You a patient of us, too? Ha! <laughs> I'll never forget those treatments. They used to put me to sleep like the dead. Now, why don't you try one now? Michael, um, it's been lovely seeing you, and we must get together if you're going to be in town for long. But in the meantime, I really have to run. I have to get to the hospital. Oh, it's running off to the hospital. You ought to break her of that habit, Mr. Cassil. Why don't you take her out of the hospital? Now, look. Because I don't want to be taken out of the hospital. Oh, all right. I'll drive you over there. I want to talk to you about doing a broadcast. Uh, scientific. You, uh, you don't mind, old fellow. Uh, do you really want to know what I think? Look, uh, Michael, I'll talk to you about it later. Uh, goodbye for now. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, while I'm still in the States, I'm going to call you every day. <laughs> I'm going to be an absolute pest. You're making a very good start. Oh, I'll do much better than this. Goodbye. 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 If he had said old fellow one more time, I think I would have killed him with my bare hands. Well, it's a, it's a good thing you didn't try it. He has muscles like an ox. 
Oh. Oh. He has muscles like an ox. He's really very nice, Andre. Well, it's a matter of whether or not you like oxes. Oxen. Oxen. All right. Terrible word, anyway. Seems to do very well here. He's quite fascinating. You know, he's been all over. Why doesn't he go back all over? Oh, you'll change your mind when you get to know him better. I don't want to know him any better. Andre, don't shout. He's just a patient of mine with a very interesting feeling. Ah, waiter, check, please. Yes, sir. After all, it's just the same thing as you going off to meet that Benson girl. That didn't mean a thing to you, did it? Well, of course not. So, you see, this doesn't mean much either. Goodbye, darling. What time is it, Leary? It's just 9.30, sir. Mm. What time did Mrs. Cassil say she'd be here? Around about 9.30, sir. She can get away from the hospital. 9.30. Good, good. The sum of the 1926 vintage tonight, sir? No, 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 not wine. Cognac. Yes, sir. Uh, you'll pardon my noticing, sir, but uh, don't you think wine would be safer in case Madame hasn't dined tonight? Uh, yes, yes, possibly, but this is not for Mrs. Cassio. Are you expecting someone else, sir? Yes, a Miss Meredith. Tonight, sir? Mm hmm, in a few minutes. But aren't there possibilities of uh, complications, sir? Uh, uh, do you think so? Well, it's very likely, sir. Uh, uh, do you suppose Mrs. Mrs. Cassio might be jealous, Leary? I, I don't know, sir. Uh, well, uh, we can try, huh? I, I'll answer that. You go and get the cognac. Yes, sir. Hello, Edith. Hello. I hope I'm not late. I had such an awful time getting away. Oh, I'm so glad to see you again. Oh, I couldn't believe my ears when you telephoned. Well, let me take your rest. I'd given you up for lost, and I heard you got married. <laughs> Sit down, Edith. <sighs> nice. Nice and cozy. I wanted to see you again because I felt I hadn't been very nice the last time you were here. Oh? Oh, the night the play opened? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. You know, Andre, you certainly must have had an awful lot of experience to write a play like that. Um, uh, sit down, Andre. Over here. <laughs> the Tony actor? Uh, uh, just leave it, please. Yes, sir. Oh, nice. Uh, uh, would you like to hear some music? Oh, sure. Put it on. I'll turn out the light. Uh-huh. There. I can hear better in the dark. Oh. Uh. <laughs> oh, you have a wonderful view from here. I have a wonderful view from my place, too. It's on 66th Street. Uh, uh, yes? Uh-huh. You can see the Hudson River. If you ever get tired of looking at the East River, you can come over to my place and look out my window and see the Hudson River. Uh, that might be a very nice change, yes. <laughs> it would be. Say, you're not expecting anybody, are you? No, why? Well, you keep looking at the door as if you're afraid somebody might come in. Oh, am I? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, when I look at a fire, it just makes me feel nice and drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just love to cuddle up. Uh, uh, would you like a cigarette? A cigarette? Oh, no, no, I don't smoke much. I don't drink much either, just once in a while. There's someone I like very, very much. And then, of course, I only take one. Mm. <laughs> well, what was that? Oh, nothing. But it sounded like the door. No, 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 no. Here, sit close to me. You know, darling, it, it's very sweet of you to come here, and, and you know you shouldn't. Well, why not? You said you wanted me to come over. So I said to myself, well, I'll come over. Hello. Oh, oh I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, this fire looks cozy. It's cold outside. Edith, this is my wife. How do you do? And, darling, this is Miss Meredith, an old friend of mine. Yes? Uh, <laughs> Uh, I thought you were going to be at the hospital tonight. Oh, no. I just had to give Michael a few shots. Watch the progress of the fever. Well, uh, I guess I'd better be going. I really have to be going. You see, I'm late for an appointment. Oh, no. Please don't go. I just dropped in to say hello. I'm going on up to change now. Wish I could stay, but you know how it is. Good night, Miss Meredith. Listen, I want to get out of here. Oh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought I'd been around, but this beats me. You didn't marry her on a bed or anything, did you? Uh, Leary, uh, get Miss Meredith's wrap, please. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to go up and explain. Go up? Where? Uh, just up. Goodbye. Well, while you're thinking up an explanation for her, will you think of one for me, too? <laughs> Andre, come in, dear. Uh, Jane, I, I want to tell you something. Don't bother, darling. I understand you were just rehearsing a scene in your new play. No, 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 we weren't. Miss Meredith is not an actress. Oh, really? She's so lovely. 
She ought to be a very good on the stage. Oh, oh you, you think she's attractive? Oh, yes, very. Uh, of course, I haven't known her very long, but... Uh... Oh, hello! How about a little three-handed game of gin rummy? What? What is he doing here? I'm keeping Michael here under observation, waiting for his fever to break. Getting better, too. Oh, I feel fine. If this man is sick, why isn't he at the hospital? Not until the serum works. He has to stay up and do all the things he does normally. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to judge how effective the treatment is. I don't like his being here. Why not? He's a friend of mine. Look, I don't object to your having your friends like Miss Meredith, do I? Yes, I know you don't, and that's just the trouble with you. Besides, it's entirely different. Miss Meredith doesn't have a fever. That's what you think. Where are you going? To fill a prescription for him. Me, old man? Yes, you, old man. Apples. A barrel of apples. Goodbye. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with Paul Lucas and Olivia de Havilland for the third act of Appointment for Love. You know, Mr. Kennedy, this week I found out for sure that spring is really here. I hope you're right, Sally. But what's your proof? Did you see a robin? No robin. But I wrote a poem. And that's a positive sign that it must be spring. Let's hear it. The sun is bright, the birds are here. My heart is light and full of cheer. But not because of spring alone has life assumed this happy tone. There really is another thing which makes me just as glad as spring. That is to know there is a way... To help my rayon stocking stay as good as new for twice as long. It's news that fills me full of song. And I can tell you what it takes. The secret is to use Lux Flakes. Just try and see if I'm not right. Your stockings last, the world is bright. (laughs) Did you like it? Very nice, Sally. And making stockings last twice as long is something for you women to be pretty happy about, isn't it? Happy? Why, it's something to write poetry about all year round. And luck certainly helps. Tests proved that silks, nylons, and rayons stand twice as much strain if they're washed in gentle luxe flakes as they do if they're rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. There are just two simple things to remember. Luxe stockings after each wearing and dry rayons from 24 to 48 hours. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Paul Lucas and I will get the details on Olivia's Aleutian journey after the play. But now the curtain rises on the third act of Appointment for Love, starring Paul Lucas and Olivia de Havilland. (laughs) Mr. and Mrs. Andre Castile, their differences patched up, have at last made a definite appointment to meet at home. But home has a different meaning for each of them. That evening, when Mr. Cassil steps into the elevator, the boy says... Seventeen, Mr. Cassil. No, twenty-two. And a few minutes later, when Mrs. Cassil arrives, looking breathlessly happy... Twenty-two, Mrs. Cassil. No, seventeen, please. After waiting (laughs) until two o'clock in the morning in his bride's apartment, Mr. Andre Cassil is good and mad. Hello, hello. This is the Henley Medical Center. Well, I want to speak to Dr. Alexander. What? She checked out? At what time? 10.30. I see. Thank you. Hello? Yes, this is Mr. Cassil's apartment. Oh, don't hang up, Miss Meredith. Tell me... Were you expecting a call from Mr. Cassil? Oh, you didn't know, but you hoped. Is that it? Well, don't worry, Miss Meredith. It happens to the best of us. You see, I've been stood up, too. Good night. Dr. Alexander's office. Oh, good morning, Mr. Cassil. Uh, no, she's not here, Mr. Cassil. She just left with Mr. Michael Daly. Uh, Mr. Cassil, please. They went to do a broadcast on the radio, the scientific forum. Mr. Castillo! I'm sorry, sir, but Studio B is on the air. You can't go in now, sir. Listen, is that the scientific forum in there? Yes, sir, but you... Then get out of my way. Please, sir. Quiet! And now we're ready for questions from the audience. The usher will pass through the aisles with the microphone. Now, 
Are there any questions you would like to ask Dr. Alexander? I have a question, please. Yes, madam. Uh, is it true, Dr. Alexander, that simple cases of measles still prove fatal to primitive people? Uh, yes, it is. The primitive man lacks resistance because his system has not had to exercise the functional guards against the disease, which creates certain immunity. Thank you. Anybody else? Let me have that microphone, please. Thank you. If she will be so kind, I have a question I would like to ask Dr. Alexander. The question is this. Where did you spend last night? On oh, Shut that mic off. You were not at home. You were not at the hospital. Where were you? <laughs> Throw that man out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm her husband. Outside, please. <laughs> What do you say, Dr. Alexander? Can you give us a statement? Sit down, boys. Hello, Pete. I haven't seen you since I was at Bellevue. That's right, Doc. You sure have been getting famous since then. Mind if we get a few pictures? No, no, not at all. Help yourself. Suppose you know why we're here, Doc. I can't imagine. Like the rest of the nation, we want to know the answer to that burning question. What question is that, Pete? Well, your husband and about a hundred million others would like to know where you spent last night. Oh. Well, all right, boys. I'll tell you. I spent last night in the apartment of one of the most charming and romantic men in all New York. You, uh, wouldn't want to give us his name, would you, Doc? Gentlemen, you think I'm a cad? Fight, my fight, my pretty doctor, tell us all. Hey, Ron, Eric's domestic fight on radio. Where were you last night? 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 Mr. Castile? Yes. What is it? Uh, Miss Benson to see you, sir. Miss Nancy Benson. Nancy? Don't get up, Pappy. Oh. Just the old fire chief calling. Hello, Nancy. Hiya. What's the matter? You look awful. Got a cold? Yes, I have a cold. Mm, it's in your feet. Come on, Pappy. Where's your sense of humor? This isn't serious. It's funny. Why be worried about publicity? I wish that were my face all over the front pages. I'm not worried about publicity. Now, don't tell me you're worried about her. She's the kind that tells her husband about the other man. And I thought doctors were supposed to be ethical. Oh, if I hadn't started it with that radio business. Well, I'll admit that wasn't very smart. But you can't sit around here moping about it the rest of your life. Leary, get Mr. Castillo's mm, hat. No, Nancy, Now, I, look, I, I... you write plays. You get your people into all sorts of jams, and you get them out very convincingly. But the first little thing that happens to you personally, you act like a schoolboy caught throwing kisses to his teacher. Come on, Pappy. You're getting out of this joint right now. Ah, uh, maybe you're right. You can get my hat, Leary. Yes, sir. You're a good guy, Nancy. So will you be dining at home tonight, sir? I suppose so. He's dining all right with me and about 85 other people. Oh, a party? But a good one. Oh, you think a party's a good idea? You bet I do. And now, for Pete's sake, stop playing Hamlet. Your hat, sir? Thank you, Leary. Oh, I, um... I suppose you read that she's going on some sort of an expedition to Mexico and getting a divorce yes, on the side. Yes, yes, I read it. I knew this thing couldn't last. You didn't have anything in common. And besides, Pappy, I never did think you were the marrying kind. That's the trouble. I am. <laughs> Going up. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Hello, Gus. Nice night. Is it? Yeah, 17, Doctor? No, 22. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you swapped apartments with Mr. Casil because of on account of the night when you stayed in 17A all night. You haven't told that to anyone else, I hope. Oh, no, ma'am. I never interfere in the private affairs of the tenants. That's a rule. Well, that's a good rule to keep. Yes, ma'am. But you see, you stayed down there all night, and he stayed up here. Who stayed up here? Mr. Casil. He came in with a big box of flowers. So I said, 17, and he said, no, 22. You know, the next day, the janitor told me he found all those flowers out on the sidewalk. Are you sure of what you're saying? Oh, yes, ma'am. But I'd better shut up before I interfere in the private affairs of the tenant. Gus, let me off at 17. Hello, Leary. Oh, good evening, madam. Leary, where's Mr. Casillo? Hello, Dr. Alexander. Who are you? Oh, it's so nice of you to come. We really didn't expect you. Andre, look who's here. Jane. Hey, there's a doctor in the house, folks. Pretty good, huh? <laughs> we thought you were halfway to Mexico by now, didn't we, Pappy? Yes. It's so much more civilized to be friendly about divorces. 
And don't you worry about Andre, Doctor. He's well on the road to a speedy recovery. Aren't you, Pappy? Will you kindly take your hands off my husband and stop calling him Pappy? Oh, now, honey, don't start getting jealous. Get your hands off. Oh! And I'm not going to get a divorce. Jane, what is this? Come with me, Pappy. I've got to speak to you. Well, what is it all about? Just ring for the elevator, please. I did. Now, what is all this nonsense? Oh, hello, folks. Going up? Hello, girls. 22, please. Get in, Andre. Where are we going? Shh, please, Andre. I've been not... Shh. Well, at least don't shout. You come downstairs in front of my friends and... Why did you come downstairs? To tell you where I spent that night. But I don't care where you spent that night. Oh, don't you? No. You were where you wanted to be and I was where I wanted to be. 22. Where? Waiting, 22. Waiting for the only woman I ever loved. Or ever will love. The only woman you ever loved? Oh, darling. Why, darling? A tomato like that and he's asking questions yet. <laughs> well, you see, while you were up here in my apartment... I was downstairs in your apartment. Me, I feel like an itty-bitty Cupid. I don't care where you... My apartment? You were in... Jane. All night, darling. But I was right here. I, I was waiting, and, and you were... I was waiting, too, for the only man I ever loved, or ever will love. Jane. Excuse me, but if the doctor gets any emergency calls tonight, do you want I should... Gus. Gus. We're surprised at you. Forgetting rule number one. Huh? Never, Never interfere, interfere with, with the private affairs, affairs of, of the, the tenants. tenants. Good, Good night, night, Gus. Good night. Oh, love. It's sickening. Our stars will return for a curtain call in just a moment. Reports from our far-flung battlefronts are encouraging, but the war is far from over. The toughest part of the job still remains to be done. We still need to produce more and more war material and need used fats from American kitchens to do it. Used fats go into the manufacture of munitions, medicines, synthetic rubber, nylon for parachutes, paint, varnishes, plastics, and a long list of other vital war and peacetime products. But now that I don't have to give points for lard or salad oil or vegetable shortening, I thought that meant there's plenty of fat. There are more of the kinds of fats we can eat, yes, but not enough of the kind needed by industry. In peacetime, we imported this kind of fat, useless for food, but essential in making many different products. Now, some of these sources of supply are cut off by the war. We must depend on used fats from your kitchen to make up the difference. Or dip into our edible fat supply. So, to help the war and to conserve the fats we need for food, keep on turning in every bit of used fat. Do we still get ration points for used fat? Yes, indeed. Two red points, as well as four cents for every pound of used fat you turn into your butcher. Use all the unrationed fats you need in cooking, but when you have finished with them, save every drop for your butcher. Turn in at least one tin of used fat a month to help our fighting men get the materials and medicines they need. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our star. It's time now for that tradition of the theater that always follows a delightful performance, the curtain call. And here are Olivia de Havilland and Paul Lucas. Thank you, C.V. It's a pleasure to be back. It was two years ago, Paul, almost exactly, that you gave me one of the most enjoyable evenings I ever spent in a, in a theater, seeing Watch on the Rhine. Thank you very much. That did turn out rather lucky for me. Well, you got the Academy Award for playing the same part in pictures. It's just possible it may have been more than luck. Hmm. I think Paul is modest by nature. He won't admit, for instance, that... Well, that he's the best tennis player in Hollywood. <laughs> there is always Mickey Rooney to beat. And if you said he was the best fencer, he'd find someone else. Well, Basil Ratbone, maybe. <laughs> and if I said, I said he made the best Hungarian goulash of any cook in Hollywood... No, but... no, no, that's right. 
That's right. My goulash is the best. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to try it sometime? Oh, indeed I would. That's a date, Paul. You know, not many girls are spending their vacations in the Aleutian Islands these days, ladies and gentlemen. But Olivia has just come back from that, well, that perpetual winter resort. And a rather large number of soldiers and sailors aren't going to forget her. Uh, how was the weather up there, Olivia? Well, in all the time I was in the Aleutians, there were only five days of sunshine. And they said that that was very unusual weather. <laughs> five days more than usual. How far out did you go? Well, I traveled by plane, and we went to every island that had a hospital right out to the end of the chain. Well, that's romantic, but I believe it's barren scenery. As barren as a tabletop, and there's a great G.I. joke up there in the Aleutians. The boys say there's a woman behind every tree. <laughs> well, I can imagine the welcome you received. Oddly enough, it's the nearest I've been to my birthplace since I left there at the age of two. So, but you weren't born in the Aleutians. No, I was born in Tokyo, Japan. Wow. <laughs> in the not-too-distant future, I... <laughs> I hope you may visit American soldiers there. I hope so, too. Now, what have you uh, planned for the Lux Radio Theater next week? It's a very simple and a very moving drama, Olivia. The Columbia picture success, Penny Serenade. And our stars will be Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton. Penny Serenade is a love story of two people who found happiness with the help of a child. And with these distinguished stars heading our cast, I think we've found some fine entertainment for next Monday night. Yes, I remember the picture, CV. It should be great for radio. Well, good night now and thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Let's have another appointment soon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton in Penny Serenade with Edgar Buchanan. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Paul Lucas will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, Uncertain Glory. The motion picture, Appointment for Love, was produced by Universal Studios, whose current release is the all-star production, Follow the Boy. Heard in tonight's play were Dennis Green as Michael, Dorothy Lovett as Edith, B. Benaderet as Nancy, Arthur Q. Bryan as Hastings, Harold DeBecker as Leary, and Stanley Farrar, Dwayne Thompson, Jack Morrison... Ed Emerson, Norman Field, Eugene Forsyth, Charles Seal, Verna Felton, and Eddie Marr. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Three bells for three great shows. Same time, same station. Listen tomorrow night at this time for George Burns and Gracie Allen and their guest star, Lana Turner. Listen Wednesday night for Frank Sinatra singing The Music Stop. Joan Leslie will be Frank's guest. This time, Lux Time. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for the tops in entertainment. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Appointment for Love has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Irene Dunn and Joseph Cotton in Penny Serenade. You can make a lighter cake. With new Easy Mix Fry. Bake a better tasting cake. With new Easy Mix Fry. And your cakes stay fresh much longer, moist and fresh a whole lot longer. Lighter cakes that stay fresh longer with new Easy Mix Fry. At your grocer's in the same handy jar, new Easy Mix Fry Shortening, brand for all baking and frying. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.